And she's going to show us that being open to failure is actually a rewarding part of our coding journey. So let's give a warm round of applause to our next presenter. So first of all, thank you guys for being willing to talk about failure on a Friday morning. I know that's like not a light topic, but I really appreciate it. So when I was 26, I decided that I, weren't, I wanted to learn to pilot a plane. And everyone thought that was crazy because I didn't even know how to drive a car, which was true, <laughs> but no one was going to clip my wings. So six months in, I'm on final approach to runway 21 in Santa Monica after a, a routine training flight. And I ease back on the throttle and lift, like, lift the plane's nose up a bit, float gently more or less to the ground, and everything was perfect. Until suddenly, the plane jerked to the left, and my instructor was like, I've got the plane. I'm like, you've got the plane. And he gets it stopped on the runway, and my heart starts calming down, and we get out to look at the damage. And it was a flat tire. No big deal. No big deal at all. So I was actually fairly surprised when my instructor said, all right, I'll drop you back off at the classroom, and then I have to head back and fill out the FAA paperwork. Now, I'm not a fan of paperwork or getting in trouble, so I was like, whoa, nothing happened here. This is just a flat tire. It's no big deal. But it turns out that the FAA collects paperwork on everything, things that are big deals and small deals. Their policy is to get as much data as possible because data actually helps you figure out how to make things better. So they know that people are afraid of getting in trouble. They know people don't like paperwork. So the policy is, as long as you didn't do anything illegal, no one got hurt, and you fill out a report, no one gets in trouble. Now think about the wildly different approach that we have for accidents on the road. When I was 12, I was riding home from the dealership with the first brand new car my parents had ever bought. And we were at a stoplight, and suddenly we lurched forward. We'd been rear-ended. My dad got out to check on the other driver. He was fine, we were fine. The only damage was a scrape on the bumper. My dad said, well, that's what bumpers are for. And because no one wanted to make any sort of insurance claims and no one was hurt, no data was collected. This accident was never recorded. So those are vastly different outcomes that lead to vastly different reports. Or out those are vastly different processes that lead to vastly different outcomes. So I looked up data for the most recent year in 2015. And for every 1 million miles people drive in the US by car, 3.1 people die. And for every 1 billion miles that people travel by air in the United States, 0.05 people die. Now, decimals, especially on a Friday morning, and when you're talking about fractions of a person, can be a little bit confusing. <laughs> so this might be a bit more helpful. 64 people die for every, by car for every one person that dies traveling by plane when you hold the mile steady. Now this, to me, this is super interesting because you have two incredibly different outcomes and two very different approaches. And the main difference is how failure is dealt with. You see, it turns out that in reality, failure is actually an incredibly important part of learning. Now, before we go too much further, it's probably a good time to figure out what we mean when we're talking about failure, because there can be lots of definitions. And I think for some of us, it's probably a bit of that sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach when you don't know the answer and there's a person with an angry face kind of looking at you and screaming and you're just like, why did I even get out of bed today? And that is definitely something that I can relate to. But I saw that a lot of lay people were describing it as the absence of success. And I was like, well, that actually makes a lot of sense too. But then I was like, okay, well, what's success? And they're like, oh, easy. That's the absence of failure. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's a little bit less helpful. But researchers, they have a very specific definition. For them, failure is deviation from an expected and desired result. Now, that's, that's not bad. And I think that in reality, there's probably a bit of truth in all three of these. But this last one is actually like very measurable, very repeatable. So we're going to stick with that one for now. Now, I actually couldn't find any definitive data on this. But I think that programming is one of those fields where you actually have a whole lot of uh, deviations from your expected results. And so you would think that programming would be the perfect place to actually learn from failure. But one of the few places in programming that I actually saw people regularly doing this was in video game development. So having space to learn from failure actually came in super handy for a group of developers that were working on a street racing game in the 90s. Their plan was to have a game 
where racers race through the streets and they're being chased by police cars. And if the police catch you and pull you over, you lose the race. But there's just one problem. They got the code for the algorithm wrong. Instead of law-abiding police cars, they got these really aggressive cops that would just slam into the racers full force. <laughs> and it turned out that the beta testers actually had a lot more fun running away from the police and trying to avoid being hit than they ever had with just the street racing game. And as a result, the entire direction of the game was switched and the Grand Theft Auto series was born. Now I want you to think about that for a minute, whether you like the game or not. The core concept of the best-selling video game of all time came from a mistake. They made the wrong algorithm. And if they had panicked and said, OK, we got it wrong. Hopefully the PM doesn't find out about this. Let's just stop the beta test, cover it up, get the algorithm right, and then we'll go with it, they would have lost like, the best-selling game of all time. Failure, as it turns out, is not something to hide from. Every bit of research shows that it's actually something that you learn from. <coughs> So in fact, it turns out that failure presents a greater learning opportunity because there's more information encoded in failure than in success. And think about it. What does success look like? A check mark, a thumbs up, a smile from a manager. And when you get that success, what have you actually learned? Well, there's a lot of research on this. And it's shown that people in organizations that only experience success and never experience failure actually become quite rigid. The problem is, success gives you one signal. Success says, keep doing exactly what you're doing right now. Don't change anything. And as long as you do that, you'll continue to be successful. What does failure look like on the other hand? Well, it kind of looks a lot like this. <laughs> look, just, just look at this. Look at how much information there is encoded in failure. If we read it, we know exactly what went wrong. We probably even know where the error was, what line it happened in. And if we've never seen this error before and we're not sure what it is, we can do a quick search and we'll find pages and pages and pages of helpful information from other people that have had this same problem. And we're just a small step away to figure out something that will work. Now, video game development actually has a long and honored tradition of learning from their failures. And it's so important in game development that it actually has a name. They call it the good bad bug. And with some larger programs, even though like this is an honored process, having a bug in there can be a big deal. So there's a thing in game development called a game design document. And by the time developers ever get to write their first line of code, hundreds if not thousands of hours of work have already been put in by product leads and designers and business people. So this document is huge. And even though it's supposed to be a living document, by the time you're working on writing code, it's a big deal to make any changes. Because tech requirement pages might have to change. Um, art might need to be redone. Release dates may need to be pushed back. Business people do not like when you push release dates back. Budgets might be off. Like, you get the deal. It is actually pretty big to change that GDD. But that was the very unhappy reality being faced by the Silent Hill developers. They'd actually started out when they got the game design document building out to the specs. And there was a problem. Pop in. You see, the PlayStation's graphics card was not advanced enough. It didn't have the capacity to render all the buildings and the textures in a scene. So as a character stepped forward, buildings would suddenly pop into existence, and blank walls would magically have texture. And this was actually pretty distracting to people. And in a horror game where like, the whole point of the game is this eerie atmosphere that just like, draws you in so you get scared by the things that pop out at you, having a building pop out was like, not great. It actually pulled people out of the game. Now, it would have been easy for everyone to start pointing fingers and blaming each other because there was absolutely no one person who was at fault. They'd each played their own little part from the designers who put just one or two more buildings in to make it a bit more interesting, to the tech team that decided, let's make it for the PlayStation instead of the more powerful 3DO, to the business team that determined the release date. There was no single individual that had made an obviously bad call. There were just a bunch of small issues that started snowballing into a big problem. You see, the entire system had failed. But instead of running from that failure, they found a way to step around it they came up with a workaround. You see, they filled the entire world with this very dense, eerie fog. 
because it turns out that fog is very lightweight for a graphics engine to render, and it obscures distant objects, which means that as the player stepped forward, it didn't really matter that stuff popped into existence because you couldn't see most of it, and the stuff that you could see, you just thought, oh, well, it was popping out of the fog. And in fact, it was so creepy that this became a staple of the Silent Hill series, long after graphics cards became powerful enough that pop-in wasn't an issue anymore. This was another success ripped from Jaws of Defeat by embracing failure. Now, these examples from programming help to illustrate what's happening at our more high-stakes example in aviation and automobile accidents. The aviation system saves so many lives because accidents are treated like lessons we can learn from. They gather data. They look at how the system can be improved. In contrast, who's usually blamed for a failure on the road? It's the driver, right? It's the individual. She can't drive. He didn't pay attention to the stop sign. They were reckless. When you treat stuff like a failure of a system instead of a failure like a person, things work out better. And so I know we're not all pilots here, but I think there's actually a lot to learn from this. And I want to propose that if we're willing to use a system to track and learn from our failures as we write code, we're going to be much better off. But what should that system actually look like? Well, I think that first we need to avoid placing blame. We need to document everything, and we have to learn to abstract patterns from the data that we gather. So step one, make sure that you understand that you are not the problem. And I know that this one is a lot easier said than done, right? Like you could have an entire talk just about how not to blame yourself when your code has a bug in it. And you know, I will just say, with aviation failures, they never stop at that top level of blame with the individual. So there's one case where a pilot made a critical error by dialing in the wrong three-digit code on a flight computer, and it led to an airplane accident. And on the cockpit recording, they could clearly hear the pilot saying, man, I am so exhausted, I can't wait to get a good night's sleep. And it would have been so easy to be like, oh, crash caused by tired pilot. But they never stopped there. They said, why was the pilot tired? So they found out if he had actually had a hotel. And then they said, well, did he actually check in? And then they looked at every time that door opened and closed to get the maximum amount of hours that he could have slept. And even then, when they determined that he'd only had four hours that he could have been sleeping that night before he got on that plane, they still looked beyond that to how a three-digit computer readout could be very confusing if you're at all distracted or tired when you're flying a plane. So look. Like them, you can be very willing to say, OK, I wasn't really focusing when I was writing that code. But you also need to look at what was wrong with your entire system. If you're ever taking away from this, like a, a bug in your code, that you're bad at writing code, or you're dumb, or you just can't get this, you're missing out on all the best parts of failure. And if you're not at the point where you can kind of quiet that inner voice and learn from that failure yet, at least just try to work the rest of the system and sidestep it. And I promise that eventually that voice will start to be a little bit more helpful. So step two, document everything, even the things that may seem small, like a tiny little flat tire on landing at Santa Monica Airport, because those small things can start to snowball and become huge things like we saw with the Silent Hill example. Catching problems early on and course correcting will stop you from having major blow ups later on. So how do you document things? I'm actually a big fan of paper documentation, but you can use whatever form you like, as long as you're able to refer back to that documentation. You should include details about what you were trying to do, the resources you were using, whether you were working with other people, um, how hungry you were, and especially what the outcome was. Get specific when you're recording these things. Don't just say, you know, if you're trying to get data from your Rails backend to your alt store and your React components are telling you that it's dispatching in the middle of a dispatch and you can't do this, don't just say React is stupid and I can do this with jQuery and why is my boss being mean to me? Because that won't work. I've tried. It doesn't work. <laughs> so the final step, now that you've got all this data, is to make sure that you can actually start going through it and abstracting patterns. Find out when you do your best work, and find out when you do your worst work. If you find that you've struggled the last few times to manipulate hashes in Ruby, actually dig in and see that maybe two out of those three times you were upset and having trouble, but one time it went well. And then look at what the difference was. Maybe you felt good the two when you were well rested. And maybe there was bad because you were pairing and your partner wasn't supportive. Or maybe it went well because you had music playing or you just had some delicious pineapple. Or you might discover that you only code well if you start out with 20 minutes of puppy cuddle time beforehand. <laughs> you know, that's a great thing to know because then you have an excuse to get a puppy and like no one can argue with that. Now, it's a lot easier to identify the parts of the system that do and don't work for you when you actually have this paper trail.
and you'll have a great log of concepts that you're struggling with. Imagine that you're reading documentation for your last epic coding session, and you're like, hey, I was trying to wire up a form for my Rate This Raccoon app, and it totally worked, sort of. The data got where I was sending it, but it ended up in the URL, and that's a bit strange. So that's a really defined problem for you to research and write a blog post on if you're ever like, I don't have any blog post topics. But now you have like all this data, and you can start looking at form documentation and say, oh, when you use a get with a form request, it puts it in the URL. I probably wanted to use a post request so it would be hidden in the body of the request. Now you just need 20 minutes of puppy cuddle time, and you are ready to go <laughs> fix that rate this raccoon form. So look, like anything else that you try, this process may not work for you right from the beginning. And at the risk of going a bit too meta, you know, just figure out what's not working for you, document that, and make adjustments. Yeah, that's right. You're going to learn from your failures while you're trying to learn from your failures. And as you get more comfortable gleaning all that info from failure, you're actually going to find that every bug really is a feature, even if you ultimately end up deleting every last line of code and starting over from scratch. All right. Thank you. That was really cool, and I wish my parents saw that presentation. <laughs>